everyone for coming. Uh, we are going to give you sort of a, an overview of the um, current state of the law, a little bit of the journey, how we, how we got here, and then I have some questions that are prepared, but we also would love to take questions from the audience, so please be thinking of those, and once we get to that point, um, uh, please feel free to speak up and raise hands. Um, I think Bobby's going to go first to get us started with okay. Second Circuit. Sounds good. Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to start with just some legal principles in this area. Let me go back for a second. And many years ago when I got started uh, advising companies, studios predominantly, about the use of trademarks in their, their movies and TV shows, there was not a lot of law. And I remember looking at the McCarthy Treatise the first time I had an issue. And the only case I could find, I remember, it was I think it was called the Starbright Battery Company v. Turner. And, or maybe, maybe the movie was called Starbright. But some uh, manufacturer of batteries was suing uh, Ted Turner's company for putting on a, a movie on TV in which a girl became sick and it was all tied to some battery plant and they used the name of a real battery company inadvertently and this was the only law I could find on how you balance the interests of the First Amendment to protect the rights to create expressive works against uh, either tarnishment or dilution or confusion as to source or sponsorship of that creative work. But since then, the law has really developed extensively in the area, so let's talk about some of the more important cases here. Um, and one of the principles that, that uh, we're going to be talking about is there is tremendous variation in the law around the country, and so where a lawsuit is litigated can be outcome determinative. And the, the first case comes from the Second Circuit, that's the first watershed case, really, from 1989, and uh, here's a visual of the poster. Um, we call the case Rogers v. Grimaldi. Uh, I'm probably dating myself if, if I mention uh, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. They were famous. Maybe everybody knows who they are, their household names. Um, but Ginger, there was a movie that Federico Fellini made in Italy called Ginger and Fred, and it was about a pair of Italian cabaret dancers who went by the name of Ginger and Fred, and they competed, and it was kind of an homage to this whole scene of dancing in Italy. Well, Ginger Rogers was, was taken aback by this and felt that the movie was trading unfairly on her name. She filed a false advertising case, importantly not a trademark infringement case, because she's an individual. She didn't have a trademark. Um, not that she couldn't have had, but she didn't. And uh, tried to um, either enjoin the film or recover damages for the distribution of the movie, claiming that people went to see the movie uh, falsely thinking that she had some association with it. Um, the decision that, that is the watershed decision is from the Second Circuit, and the Second Circuit said, wait a second, there is a very important First Amendment issue at stake here. It is important for creators of expressive works to be able to depict reality, to be able to enrich their works and give them verisimilitude, if I can use a $5 word. Um, and so that First Amendment right has to be balanced against whatever interest Ginger, Roger has, Ginger Rogers has in her name. And the way we're going to do it is create a two-part test. And the two-part test, has, part one is, is the use of, is there artistic relevance to the use of uh, Ginger Rogers' name? Well, uh, here, undoubtedly, there was uh, these, and... Factually, you can read the opinion, but it's a, a thoughtful discussion about how um, as long as there is a minimum amount, a little bit less than zero, any amount less than zero of artistic relevance to the use, that passes the first prong of the test the Second Circuit announced. The second question was, was the use explicitly misleading? Um, did it explicitly cause people to think erroneously, obviously misleading, that Ginger Rogers had some association with the movie? And the, the court concluded there's no way anybody could have thought that, given what the movie was about. It was fictitious, et cetera. So that's Rogers v. Grimaldi, 1989. Two-prong test, artistic relevance, explicitly misleading. And it's from the Second Circuit. And then uh, the Second Circuit evolved the law a little bit uh, a few years later with uh, Twin Peaks. And in between, there was an important case involving um, Cliff's Notes, where the principle of uh, Rogers v. Grimaldi was applied not just to the title of an expressive work, but to the content 
of an expressive work. Twin Peaks in 1993 creates an important variation in the law. Uh, and what the Second Circuit said in the Twin Peaks case was when you're evaluating, and, um, and back up just to look at what the facts are, do, Twin Peaks, does anyone remember the t David Lynch directed TV show? First season, huge hit, second season, maybe not so much so. Um, somebody not associated with Twin Peaks decided to attempt to capitalize on the popularity by doing this little book, selling this book, and um, called Welcome to Twin Peaks. And it had in-depth discussions of who the characters were, the plots, what have you. Um, it, we'd call this merch today. Uh, and the creators of the show, Twin Peaks Productions, sued, saying, wait a minute, and they sued under the Lanham Act, 43A, you can't do this. Um, you are creating confusion as to source or sponsorship. Um, and what the Second Circuit said is, Rogers is the cornerstone of this, but the way Rogers has been applied, or these principles have been applied, needs some modification. And the specific modification is that any court resolving these kinds of issues needs to do a traditional analysis of likelihood of confusion factors under the Polaroid test that the Second Circuit had established in the 1960s. And most circuits have their own version of it. The Ninth Circuit is called Sleekcraft. It's eight factors, usually, um, that a court balances and evaluates in determining whether there is a likelihood of confusion stemming from the defendant's use of, call it the plaintiff's mark. And what the, the Second Circuit said is, in order to satisfy Rogers, you have to, not should, you have to apply the Polaroid uh, factors. And the only way the plaintiff gets to pursue the claim in order to protect the First Amendment interests at stake is if the plaintiff can establish a particularly compelling showing under the Polaroid factors of a likelihood of confusion. Now, no court has actually told us what a particularly compelling showing means or requires. You couldn't say that, for example, under the actual confusion prong, you need X percent of a survey group to be confused, and if you're less than X, uh, the defendant is entitled to prevail as a matter of law. It's, it's left to, to courts to resolve, but um, for better or worse, those are the core principles that govern balancing in the Second Circuit, balancing the, the interest in the First Amendment against the interests in trademark law. And what I'd like to do now is turn this over um, to those to my right, your left, to explain how this has been carried out elsewhere in the country and applied in other cases. So in the Ninth Circuit, uh, there's been a, quite a bit of legal development of this test. Um, and I'll, I'll begin my discussion uh, with Mattel versus MCA, a case from 2002 in the Ninth Circuit. So up till now, what we've seen is uh, these two provisions or these two requirements that if something is, uh, if a particular use is artistically relevant and not explicitly misleading, it is uh, a permitted use as long as it does not create a particularly compelling likelihood of confusion. Um, that last portion uh, means that we end up running through all of the factors uh, just to get to the question of whether something is artistically relevant uh, and not explicitly misleading. In the Ninth Circuit, the, the series of factors, the Sleecraft factors in the Ninth Circuit, um, takes a back seat to those two core questions, uh, the question of artistic relevance and explicit misleadingness, um, but it ends up getting folded in, the, that sort of confusion question ends up getting folded in elsewhere uh, because the Ninth Circuit has recently, it sort of transformed the question of explicitly misleading into one that actually might mean implicitly misleading. So how do we get there? Mattel versus MCA uh, adopted the Rogers versus Grimaldi test into the Ninth Circuit. It's about Aqua's song Barbie Girl, which you see represented here. Um, 
And the court held that the use of the Barbie mark, uh, the Barbie word mark, uh, was allowed under the First Amendment in this expressive work uh, because it was artistically relevant to the song, which was about the cultural meaning of Barbie, um, and it did not explicitly mislead anyone into believing that Mattel had sponsored or approved the song. The court also pointed out that this use was not dilutive of the Barbie mark, uh, so it wasn't just... It wasn't just that there was no confusion, it was also that there was no dilution because it was an expressive use rather than a commercial use. And for a use to constitute dilution, it must be a commercial use in commerce, not an expressive use in commerce. Uh, so that's where we are in 2002. It gets more complicated in 2008 with ESS versus Rockstar. Um, on one hand, ESS versus Rockstar clarified that the artistic relevance bar is extremely low. Uh, this involved the uh, the video game uh, Grand Theft Auto and the, the Los Angeles uh, parody version of it, um, and uh, a parody of the famous Playpen strip club in Los Angeles turned into the pig pen in the game um, was permitted as a matter of trademark law, um, even though the game was not about the playpen, it was about running around Los Angeles and crashing into things with your car, um, using it was relevant to a parody of Los Angeles um, because artistically relevant in this sense in the Ninth Circuit means more than 0% relevant. Right? So the bar for relevance, very low. But the court here muddled the water about what explicitly misleading means. Uh, the court found that this use was not explicitly misleading, but discussed whether one would perceive the game as implying that the playpen had sponsored or approved it, um, and said that essentially if the game had implied that, it would have made the use of the mark potentially misleading, which is... Uh, as a matter of the English language, not what explicit means, but uh, far be it for me to correct the Ninth Circuit on that. Um, so that's where we are uh, in 2008. And then some time passed and we got a couple more cases that addressed this. Um, one in 2017, 20th Century Fox versus Empire Distribution. Um, this is different from the previous two because it's not a reference to the mark holder in a First Amendment protected work. It's not a nominative type use. It's a use where uh, the record company in Empire, the TV show, has the same name as a record company in the world, Empire Records. Um, and the court said that this was allowed uh, even though there was some potential for confusion uh, because uh, the mark's artistic relevance um, to was, uh, was present here and it was not explicitly misleading. The court clarified that something can be artistically relevant not only by referring to the mark holder, but also by referring to what the mark might otherwise mean. And so here... Empire, the TV show, wasn't referring to Empire Records, the company, but was referring to the fact that the TV show pl took place in New York State, the Empire State, and that the record company was somewhat of an empire, right? So it was an, a double entendre on that word. So the use of the word was artistically relevant, um, and, uh, the, and the use was not explicitly misleading. Uh, the court did ask about likelihood of confusion as well as explicit uh, indications or overt claims, but said this wasn't misleading. Then a year later, uh, we get the case that really, I think, has muddied the water in the Ninth Circuit quite a bit about what explicitly misleading means, Gordon versus Drape Creator. This is about uh, the honey badger related catchphrases that uh, appear in uh, this rather well-known uh, viral video on YouTube um, in which uh, the uh, honey, bastard, uh, honey badger don't give an S, um, right? So um, these uh, phrases on, uh, that from the video 
have been uh, sort of plastered all over various commercial products by people who are not the maker of the video. Um, and I have to admit, as a, on a personal level, this feels way more copyrighty than trademarky to me. Um, but it was a trademark case uh, because the maker of the viral video had registered the trademark, uh, Honey Badger Don't Give a S, um, uh, for various sorts of merchandise as a brand. Um, so uh, the court said, this is a trademark, and we have to ask whether this use uh, is expressive and permitted under the First Amendment. The, card, uh, the cards were, according to the court, expressive, albeit barely so, was the court's uh, uh, description. Um, and the use was artistically relevant uh, to the point of the card. In fact, it was kind of the whole point of the card. And for that reason, the court said uh, that the use was explicitly misleading. Um, the court rejected, uh, if you'll permit the pun, explicitly rejected uh, the premise that the that explicit misleadingness requires an affirmative statement of the plaintiff's sponsorship or endorsement, um, thereby folding implicit misleadingness into its definition of explicit misleadingness, um, and asked, well, does the user uh, add expressive content beyond the mark itself? Uh, if the user does not add expressive content beyond the mark itself, then the use of the mark is explicitly misleading. Um, and said, uh, we, need to we need to look more at whether there was added uh, uh, content here or enough added content and sent it back as a question of fact on remand. Um, the quote here is that, the Rogers test is not an automatic safe harbor for any minimally expressive work that copies someone else's mark. That's what the Ninth Circuit has to say about it. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, to Peter Midgley and others at BYU for having me. It's an honor to be here. Um, and it's also a lot of fun for me to be here because usually when I get invited to speak at conferences, it's about copyright law. And I get to sit up here and talk about the importance of copyright and how piracy is terrible and horrible and how all our aggressive uh, enforcement tactics are, are necessary. And I'm used to people, especially at academic institutions, throwing uh, rocks and bottles at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's so I really enjoy being able to, to be here and talk about all the oppressive, overbearing tactics of trademark owners <laughs> and how they really ought to just lighten up. Um, it's, a, it's a fun little switch. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to just tick through uh, a few of the cases. So as I, as, uh, as you know, I work at the Motion Picture Association. We represent the major motion picture studios, and although uh, the studios are are large uh, holders of large trademark portfolios, we often find ourselves um, on the defense side in these uh, kinds of disputes where. Uh, the producers of movies and TV shows want to make reference to or depict uh, real products and services in some way. And, uh, and not infrequently, those uh, trademark owners don't like the way that they're being portrayed and bring lawsuits under various uh, trademark or Lanham Act um, theories. And I just want to tick through a couple of those examples. So, Bobby, if you could just advance the slide. Um, so, so Bobby mentioned, and 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 uh, Betsy took through, you know, the a lot of the differences and the intricacies of the case law. Bobby said, you know, well, it's 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 really outcome determinative where you end up in the country and where you're litigating this, and it's super complicated. Um, I'm here to tell you it's actually really pretty simple. Um, in fact, I think of all the cases that we've discussed so far, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I think all except the Honey Badger case went for the defendant. And the cases that I'm going to tick through um, over the next couple of minutes, the, in fact, they all went for uh, the defendant um, as well. And the bottom line is, um, uh, from the perspective of the companies that we represent, um, if you want to depict a product or a service um, that has trademark protection in a movie or TV show, that's allowed. It's either outside the bounds of trademark law, 
trademark law altogether, or even if you can make out a prima facie uh, trademark case or Lanham Act case, uh, it's nonetheless protected by the First Amendment and you lose uh, if you're the plaintiff. Um, so the first case uh, is uh, known as the slip and slide case. Whammo versus Paramount Pictures. It was filed in the Northern District of California back in 2003. This involved the classic film, which um, shockingly does not, did not win any Academy Awards, Dickie Roberts' former child star. Uh, this starred um, David Spade as a kind of washed up former child star who never got to live a, a real childhood and he's adopted by this family and they kind of take it upon themselves to teach him what it's like to be a real kid. And he goes through a bunch of adventures and one of the things they teach him, uh, they want to teach him how to do is play on a slip and slide. You remember these, uh, these slides, you fill them with air and water and, and hose them down and you run head first and hopefully into a lawn and nothing bad happens. Well, in, in real life, of course, lots of bad things happen. Uh, people misuse these, they didn't follow the instructions. Um, there was all kinds of real litigation over real injuries. Um, but of course, this was put to comedic effect in, uh, in Dickie Roberts' former child star. So uh, David Spade uh, you know, misuses this thing. He doesn't, he doesn't, they don't wash it, water it down. He, of course, scrapes up his whole chest. They then uh, lubricate it too much, and he goes flying off uh, the end and, and gets uh, you know, injured in kind of a comical way. Um, and uh, of course, the, the whammo, the slip and slide people, whammo, didn't like this. They ran in uh, to court in the Northern District of California uh, and tried to enjoin the, uh, the, the release of the film. Um, and the court very quickly said no. Um, that essentially there's no, there's no likelihood of confusion here. This is really not what trademark law is talking about. Uh, let's go on to the next slide. Um, another very similar case. Uh, this one involved George of the Jungle 2. Uh, this is actually a straight to DVD release by Disney. Um, and you know, George is the hero and the, the villains in the case are these bad people who want to destroy the jungle um, riding, you know, using um, actual caterpillar uh, bulldozers. Um, of course, the caterpillar people were not happy about this. Their, their, uh, their products were being portrayed as, you know, sort of tools of the villain. They ran into federal court in the Central District of Illinois, where Caterpillar happens to be based, um, trying to get a TRO and joining release of the, um, uh, of the DVD. Um, and the court you know, essentially looked at all the, the, the Lanham Act claims and said, no, this is really not what, it's, what trademark law is all about. Um, even, it's true, Caterpillar made arguments that, well, you know, it's, we're, not, we're not just about selling uh, big bulldozers, we also have an $800 million a year licensing business where we make toys and, and games and all sorts of stuff. Um, and the court said, no, um, this is still really, no one's gonna be confused um, by think, uh, you know, be, uh, as to the sponsorship or um, certainly not gonna go and buy the wrong uh, counter, uh, tractor because uh, they saw something in George of the Jungle too. Uh, next slide, please. Um, another example, um, this is the, from the Mel Gibson movie, uh, What Women Want. Uh, there was a scene, takes place, I believe, in an advertising agency. They're kind of uh, sitting around, kind of trying to come up with uh, creative ideas. The idea is this is a, a creative space um, where they have fun things. I guess, you know, uh, today in Silicon Valley, they have foosball, famously have foosball machines and ping pong tables. Back in this uh, rendering, they had the pinball machines. And you'll see one in the back that says, uh, oops, let me make sure I get it right. Silver Slugger. Um, and that wasn't chosen for any particular reason, but of course, uh, this company, Gottlieb Development, which had both uh, copyright and, and trademarks um, in some of the things on this pinball machine, uh, sued for both copyright and trademark infringement. Court said that the, uh, the, w the copyright infringement was de minimis, um, and again, really said to, uh, about, uh, about the trademark claim, no one is gonna be confused into thinking that the owners of the, of the pinball machine had any uh, sponsorship or affiliation with the, uh, with the movie. Um, I think I have one more just to tick through quickly and I'll sum things up. Uh, another case, this was from the movie Hangover 2. Um, and there was kind of a running joke uh, throughout of it, th throughout the, the movie. There, um, you see Bradley Cooper and Zach Galifianakis, they're off to meet their friends for, at a bachelor party in Thailand. So here they are leaving to, to fly 
Zach Galifianakis is kind of this uh, weird, quirky character who likes to think of himself as very sophisticated, but in reality is kind of clueless. And there's this running joke where he's sitting next to one of his, um, what appears to be Louis Vuitton bags, and he refers to them as a Louis Vuitton bag, um, again showing that he's kind of that he's kind of clueless. Um, the Louis Vuitton people did not think this was very funny. They sued and they said, "We're not we're not complaining about the fact that you're depicting." Louis Vuitton uh, or, or poking fun at it in the movie. What we're complaining about is that the actual bag that you used was itself a knockoff. Um, it's, it's unclear to me why they made that claim or whether, or whether anybody could really, who was watching the movie could really even tell um, from the distance and the, and the way it was depicted that it was a knockoff. Um, but again, the court said, look, it, it really doesn't matter. This is artistically protected. Uh, this is outside the scope of what of what uh, copyright is all about. I think I have one last one to tick through carefully before I wrap up, or uh, uh, quickly before I wrap up. Um, the Dark Knight Rises, which is one of the Batman movies, um, featured a, uh, a sort of one of the plot points was that there was this fictional software called Clean Slate, which could essentially wipe out all of your criminal history so that you could go on about your life. Well, lo and behold, there's an actual piece of software sold in the real world called Clean Slate. It's kind of security software for these like public computers, like if you're at the business center of a, of a hotel and you, you know, various people can use it. When you're done, um, this kind of software sort of cleans it all out and makes sure that none of your, uh, none of your confidential information is there anymore. Um, they didn't think this was very funny. In fact, they claimed that their, uh, that their, that their business actually suffered um, the sales fell because uh, of the uh, the reference to it in war in the uh, in the Dark Knight Rises. Um, again, the court said this was basically outside the scope of of trademark law and nonetheless protected by the First Amendment. Um, I didn't get too too far into the details of the of the claims or the exact defenses that the that the studios brought, but I think what you see running the the theme running through the court's evaluation of these claims is I would say two things. More serious one is, look, this is not what trademark law is all about. If we think of the classic trademark case of, you know, I pull into, uh, I'm hungry and I'm driving down the street and I see something that says McDonald's and I see the golden arches, um, the law should ensure that that really is a McDonald's, that it's not some knockoff and I'm going to get the quality of, of food that I'm, that I normally would associate with McDonald's and I'm never confused about what kind of food I'm actually getting. Um, what we have here is so far removed from that scenario, so far from the original purposes of trademark law that we're really not going to um, we're, we're not going to give these people a legitimate claim. Um, but then the other the other theme it's kind of unspoken, but you see several hints of this running through the language in the in these uh, opinions is, come on guys, just lighten up. Um, this is not uh, no one's really affecting your sales. Um, you should just not take this seriously. It's just a movie. Come on, no one is really, com no one is, no one is going to buy fewer caterpillar uh, tractors or bulldozers um, because of this movie. No one is going to buy more or fewer uh, slip and slides because of your movie. No one's going to buy, uh, stop, stop buying Louis Vuitton bags because they saw it in Hangover. So just lighten up and move on with your life. So thank you for the wrap up. Um, before we get to the questions, there is some um, desire to rebut some of um, Ben's most recent statements, I think. So I'll go ahead and we'll get a little controversy worked up here. We, I, we've got a lot of um, concurrence, but I think there's some room to, to dig in a little. So go ahead. Uh, uh, just a little bit. By the way, just so you know up front, Ben and I our friends, former <laughs> colleagues. I'm not going to call him ignorant, but um, I. For the I moment. <laughs> um, but I do want to respond to a couple of things. First, it, it does depend where you sue, and it can be it can make a difference. Um, not everybody loses, so let's let me first address that. So let's go back for a second to look at Twin Peaks. Here, the defendant lost. Um, here, the Second Circuit sent the case back and said, you know, district court judge, go through the Polaroid factors and determine whether there is a particularly compelling showing of a likelihood of confusion before you resolve this case. 
And in terms of whether the explicitly misleading prong of Rogers really is what governs in the Second Circuit, under Twin Peaks, it couldn't possibly govern. Take a closer look at what's going on here. On the cover, right at, under, beneath, beneath the picture of those mountains, it says this publication is not licensed by, nor is Publications International affiliated with. So there's an express disclaimer there couldn't possibly be explicitly misleading as to source or sponsorship, and it gets repeated on the back. So notwithstanding the express disclaimer of an association, the Second Circuit said not good enough uh, to excuse uh, what went on here. Send this back. Um, so there's one where the defendant didn't win. Another, another one, which isn't in this list because it didn't get resolved at the summary judgment stage, is a case called Dove Audio v. Simon & Schuster. And there, the issue was the use of, of uh, the Book of Virtues and the Children's Book of Virtues. And after a bench trial, where there wasn't even any evidence of confusion put in on, on that prong of actual confusion, there was no survey, Judge Sands at the bench trial ruled in favor of the plaintiff and enjoined the use of a Children's Book of Virtue by the owner of the mark, the Book of Virtues. So not every defendant wins. And what I think is a common thread in a lot of the cases that Ben spoke about, if you look at them just visually, certainly in the feature film area, um, it's de minimis use. It's a passing reference, it's a car driving in a scene, it's a caterpillar tractor here, it's, a, it's, it's something that gets caught up in behind the scene of the camera and the camera frame that gets used, and, and courts can and should rightfully say, um, get a life, and, you know, but, are there cases, and could there be cases, where you can't brush it off this easily? And I'm working on one now. I, it would be an interesting question to see if what I'm saying holds water, or Ben is right, and we'll know in a few months. The case is pending in the Southern District of New York. I represent a company called AM General. They manufacture the Humvee military vehicle, and we have filed a trademark and other related type claims against the maker of the Call of Duty video games for depicting the Humvee in nine of its games without getting a license. But they not only depicted it in the games 200 plus times, um, it's in their ads, in the launch trailer of some of their games. It's the first image you see, and Humvees are in a third of the time of their ads. They took Humvees to live events and put their logo of their games on the doors of the Humvees. They had internal planning for um, contests where they would give away Humvees to the winner in order to drive interest in the game. They authorized Mattel's Megablocks company to build toys, to sell toy construction sets of Humvees. Um, and we had a survey where one out of every six persons in the survey population who played the game or were exposed to the content were confused into thinking that the manufacturer of the Humvee was somehow associated with the maker of this game or with the game. And there are plenty of internal documents from, the, uh, from within Activision talking about how they wanted to put the Humvee in these games in order to drive interest. Um, this was not something going in you know, the background of a scene. And indeed, um, I was deposing the, uh, the president of the company and about a deal they were doing with Jeep to promote Modern Warfare 3. And I asked him, how much money would Jeep have had to pay you to keep the Humvee not only out of the game, but out of the advertising for the game? And we got into a little back and forth, and I got to one point, I said, sir, if, w if Jeep had agreed to pay you $50 million to keep the Humvee out of the game, would that have been a sufficient sum of money for you to agree? And he said, I don't know. Um, so that may be an extreme example that is very different from the cases that we've been talking about here where the First Amendment should yield. Um, and that's an example where somebody is reaping where they didn't sow. Maybe not, I could be totally wrong. The, the motion's under submission in front of Judge Daniels and we'll get a decision in a few months and, and we'll see. Um, thank you. Yeah, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm seated between uh, these these two men because I uh, I provide a viewpoint in between them, um, on this case at least. Um, and you were about to hear me say something that you know Ben made the joke that uh, we we are often at odds. Um, like somebody record this, Ben should be right here, right? Um, when I'm saying that out loud. Uh, I, I think he should be right. I think maybe he isn't. 
um, in terms of the way these cases have been treated, um, right, to say that uh, that all of these cases have been easy wins uh, for the defendants is not uh, true. I think they've been hard fought wins for the defendants. Um, and uh, one of the patterns we've seen is not only that many of these uses are fleeting and small, but also that they're quite negative. Um, and so certainly when you look at the depiction of, uh, of a mark in a work that is, uh, that is negative, right, that it's the, the mark or the products of the mark holder are poked fun at um, or derided, the mark holder isn't going to like that, but it also means confusion is going to be less likely. So if you're walking through the sleek craft factors, you're going to find a uh, much less likelihood of, uh, of confusion as to sponsorship or affiliation, uh, which leads to the, I think, really perverse result that negative portrayals are less likely to be infringing than realistic ones. Um, and if our First Amendment is here to allow realistic portrayals of our world, we need to have a world, like look at the front of this desk, right? It's a, we live in a world full of marks. Um, so another counter example um, where, uh, where the defendant didn't win um, also has to do with the video game. Um, and specifically has to do, uh, there are a couple of counter examples having to do with video games. Now, whether that's because uh, courts disrespect the free speech writers of, vis of video games makers uh, is, a, is an open question and I think is likely part of it. Um, but also, um, there's a case about uh, EA and uh, the video game Battlefield um, where uh, Bell, Hex Bell Textron sued over... Uh, the incorporation of Huey helicopters in a in a video game about the Vietnam War. Now you can't tell a story about the Vietnam War without having Huey helicopters. Um, so for verisimilitude, uh, that was necessary. But that uh, case ended up not being an easy win for the defense at all, and ultimately settling. Um, so we don't have a ruling uh, that uh, that really gives a definitive answer on that question. I know what Bobby wants the answer to be, um, uh, and I want it to be different. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I think that if these sorts of portrayals of the world where uh, marks are ubiquitous um, uh, may lead to some different results uh, than the ones that Ben described and, and shouldn't. Yeah, I just wanted to respond briefly. I mean, I, I probably did overstate the... the uh, overstate it when I said that, that all of the defendants here lost. Um, I'm sorry, one. Um, but the, t the two cases that were, that were brought up as the counterexamples, one, the Honey Badger case, and then two, the Twin Peaks case, um, to, to borrow a phrase from Betsy, um, those are a lot more copyrighty than trademarky to me. I mean, the book, the book in, 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 bo in the book, in the case of the Twin Peaks book, there was a copyright claim which was actually successful. I mean, the, the, the question essentially was, was the book really just a derivative work of the, of the series? And I think there's a legitimate argument that it was. The Honey Badger case, again, it was pled as a, copy, as a trademark case, not a copyright case, but it, it really does seem to be more um, in, the, in the copyright world itself. Um, just to, to sort of defend the, the overall point I was making, in these cases where you have an expressive work and you depict or, or portray or reference a, uh, a, a product or service that is protected by trademark. Um, the cases I do think are fairly consistent. I would say, push back a little bit on what Bobby was saying, these, are, these uses are not all de minimis. I mean, that scene around, slip and, around the slip and slide was a very prominent use of slip and slide. It was a, a lengthy scene. It was one of the, sort of the highlights of the, of the movie. Um, same with uh, you know, the, the caterpillars in George of the Jungle. Um, the, the pinball machine, that, was, that really was a, a de minimis use. But um, again, the, I think the, the position uh, that, that our companies would take and the, the courts have um, almost entirely agreed with is that simply referencing a product or service in an expressive work um, is not actionable. I mean, we can, these are the cases that made it to litigation, but there are just umpteen cases, including very negative portrayals, which didn't. And it's just off the top of my head. Um, movies like The Social Network, which was, you know, had umpteen references to Facebook. The whole thing was about Facebook. Um, they didn't have a trademark claim. 
uh, the movie The Insider about Brown and Williamson and the, the, the tobacco uh, the scandal and the, um, uh, the whistleblower. Um, lots of negative references to Brown and Williamson and CBS actually. Um, never resulted in trademark uh, suits. Um, the informant about the ADM whistleblower, lots of references to ADM, they had no trademark claims. So again, most uh, we, had a, we had a few kind of amusing ones that actually did make it um, to uh, through the courthouse door, um, but the vast majorities, I think, uh, when they look at it, even if companies are not happy with the way they're um, being portrayed, uh, you know, uh, take a look at it and say, well, we're just gonna have to sort of ride this one out. So I want to pick up on something that has been a little bit of a theme, but not brought to the forefront very much, but that is, and it came up in the deposition question you were asking, but how do entertainment creators, expressive work creators, balance having paid promotions, because we all know that one of the ways creative works get made is because brand owners will pay large sums of money to have their works included in these things. How are they balancing that with, and this I think Betsy goes into whether that's implicit or not, because that's a bit of a factor in that test, with the just wanting it to reflect reality? Uh, sure, I'll take, I'll take a first crack at that one. And I mean, I would say the there's the, first of all, there's the need to, to borrow Bobby's $5 word, the, the desire for verisimilitude. Um, when you want a scene in a movie, or a TV show, you want it to look real. Um, and that includes having real products and services. Um, there's also a recognition, and the, the producers and the writers will actually, actually use this term, that the screen is valuable real estate. And they don't want to just give it away for free. So if, you, if there's a scene in a movie and somebody's drinking Coca-Cola or uh, Dasani water, there's a pretty good chance that uh, Coca-Cola or, or Dasani is actually paying to put it there, and then you're obviously going not going to have a lawsuit. Those are obviously um, usually very either neutral or positive portrayals, and in fact, the uh, the agreements, um, the product placement agreements, essentially mandate <laughs> that they be uh, neutral to positive um, in those portrayals. Um, but uh, but again, there's lots of situations when um, either you don't want to have to pay. I mean, just think think of all every mo every TV show you see. Um, there are, at least it's set in the real world, there's usually cars driving up and down, down the street. Um, those either, they're not cleared. Um, in other words, they're not, the, the producers do not seek permission from Ford and GM and Mercedes and BMW and, and whatever else happens to be driving down the street. Um, and nor are there, is there product placement unless in the, the relatively rare case where the car um, plays or, or truck uh, plays so prominently. I think um, I remember reading the press and some of the, you know, Aston Martin, I believe, has a deal in some of the James Bond movies. They're so, they're so prominently uh, portrayed. So, so I'll add to that. Um, I, I, through my experience with TV production, um, actually quite a few of those car appearances, even relatively small ones, are paid promotions. Um, and they come with a lot of strings. Uh, so uh, those agreements do say, you know, we'll pay you to put our Hyundai uh, in, your, uh, in your show, uh, but you're going to need to show it in three-quarter profile at some point during the show, and you're going to need to show somebody using the, uh, the nav system at some point in your show, and they have that sort of thing. Um, and those are actually very common um, in TV production. Um, they also come with narrative strings uh, that you maybe can't have the villain driving uh, that car, for example. Um, so, uh, although a lot of uh, a lot of uh, TV producers would prefer uh, never to put anything on that expensive real estate that isn't paid for, often they have to to um, to just get around uh, the restrictions that would be placed on what is, um, what's there. And of course, we shouldn't uh, assume that all uh, expressive works are made by people uh, who have the, the eyeball access to merit having uh, paid placements um, in their works. Um, so we don't want to generalize that uh, all appearances on screen uh, or in a game are, are paid placements. Uh, because it's going to depend on a lot of factors. If we do generalize, if we do make that assumption, it ends up having really wonky 
effects on the law because uh, we don't want people to start thinking that everything is paid because then all of a sudden uh, the law expects everything to be paid. Um, so uh, we can come back to that later, but I wanted to kind of flag that as an issue for the future. So I want to take the flip side of this a little bit as well, which is if you're the entertainment creator and you're trying to protect your brands in the real world, how do those cases look? What happens when there's the Stranger Things pop-up bar that opens in New York or Princess Leia socks or, you know, there's lots of examples of these. I'll let you guys, whoever wants to. Those become conventional trademarks, and to the extent they're entitled to protection, they get protection, and to the extent there's confusion, they're enforced. Um, only Paramount Pictures can sponsor or give rights to somebody to create a Bubba Gump Shrimp Company restaurant. That's their property from Forrest Gump. Um, and there's no First Amendment rights in creating a restaurant. No. Yeah. Uh, although, so, but Bobby, talk about if there weren't actually Bubba Gump Shrimp Company restaurants in the real world, then... Like, let's talk about Duff Beer and Krusty Krab. Right, right. Are there, there Where there's no actual trademark use, there's no product or there's service no that's commerce. being... There's no use in commerce. No you don't have any trademark rights. So what, you know, what do you then do? Go ahead. So I, I have opinions on this, and I think here is where I stop saying that Ben is right. Um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but but an, an expressive use in fiction is not the same as a use in commerce uh, of of something that would give right to trademark uh, uh, give give rise to trademark ownership, um, except as to particular kinds of goods and services. Um, and so, uh, to the extent that uh, an, an entertainment company wants to argue that the fictional existence of Duff Beer means that they somehow own, own rights in the mark for the class of goods of real life beer, um, right, they're gonna have to prove that that's an association that consumers would make. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, we also wanna be, uh, so there was a case about this, Krusty Krab uh, case, uh, where, um, where the, the producers of SpongeBob uh, were able to prevent somebody from um, from making a Krusty Krab restaurant uh, on the basis that there was an implication that um, that that uh, Nickelodeon sponsored or approved of that restaurant, um, which may well be true for that case. I don't love that case personally, uh, but I think we also need to t think a lot about what the use is and what people are going to believe of the uh, believe the use is. Um, and I say that because I spend a lot of time working with fans. Um, and how else does one express that one is a fan other than by um, making things that represent your fandom, right? Making costumes that, uh, that may imitate the costumes on a show. Um, right? if, you're, if you're a fan of uh, Star Wars and you want to make a nonprofit, and call yourself the 501st Legion, uh, you certainly don't want Disney saying, well, you're not allowed to do that uh, because, because we own stormtroopers and the, and the concept of numbered legions of stormtroopers. Right? So I think we need, to, we need to think a little bit carefully about what we're doing when we say that uh, fictional uh, portrayals can give, life, give uh, real life marks life. So if this is allowed, I actually have a question for Bobby. Um, you mentioned a few minutes ago uh, talking about your the the Humvee case. Um, you know, you had this. Uh, there was a survey in the case, and you know, X percentage of people who played the game uh, thought mistakenly that there was some sort of sponsorship or affiliation um, uh, by the um, uh, AM General. Um, my question is, why should that matter? Um, why does it matter that there's some percentage of people who mistakenly think that there's some sponsorship? And I'm thinking, if I was a lay person who maybe had played the game, uh, didn't know a whole lot about trademark law, if I even knew that there was such a thing as trademark law, but if someone asked me, hey, do you think there's a, a some sort of sponsorship or affiliation between those two companies? And I, th I might have, my, I was trying, trying to think what my mental process would be like. I would think, hmm, 
I wonder if that's the, the kind of thing that um, you know, maker video game publishers would be legally required to get permission in order to do. And you know, we're we're up here, we're sophisticated lawyers debating these things, and we have differences of opinion. Law is not maybe entirely clear. Um, why should it be relevant to have a layperson's interpretation of whether permission is required be relevant to the ultimate success of the claim when, when their understanding of the law itself may uh, be entirely incorrect? Well, first of all, uh, I will answer your question. It, 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 it is important to, it matters, the, the percent of confusion or the fact of confusion in a survey matters for a number of reasons. One, because the Second Circuit tells us it matters. Um, and when you're litigating in the Second Circuit, you do what the Second Circuit tells you we're to do. We're in Utah right now. We're <laughs> not in the Second Circuit, which is, proves my point that where you file it can be outcome determinative. Um, but uh, why does it matter to the Second Circuit? Um, it matters to the Second Circuit because they're, trying, they're struggling to find a balance between the interest in free expression and the interest in avoiding confusion and people coattailing on things they had nothing to do. Goodwill, they had nothing to do with creating. And the Second Circuit has said, in order to balance those two interests, we're going to determine if there is a compelling case of confusion. And one of the factors in confusion um, is evidence of actual confusion. And survey evidence is evidence of actual confusion. But bear in mind, we did not ask anybody does the maker of this video game need someone's permission? We're not asking them for their legal opinion. We're simply asking them, um, did you see something in there? And if you saw something in there, do you think the maker of that product is in some way associated with or sponsored this video game? And I think that matters for the additional reason that I don't think we ought to live in a world where companies can get away with using other people's intellectual property without paying for it on the grounds that they're simply satisfying the public's demand for realistic entertainment. I mean, if that's, then we might as well just do away with the Lanham Act because then it's like whatever you can get away with, you can get away with. As long as you're satisfying the public's demand for something, that's good enough. And I know you don't want to live in that world. And if I can I, just. I do. <laughs> if I can add on to that, and I, I'm not fully on board with what Bobby was saying, but trademark law also has this, it, it's interesting in the intellectual property law bucket space that it does have this consumer protection element to it as well. And that's, I think, why we pay attention to what lay people think is, now whether are they actually being harmed by that? Is there some sort of misrepresentation? And should the law be worrying about it is, I think, the, the chief beef here. So I want to clarify my interjection. I, I don't want to live in a life where we throw, uh, live in a world where we throw away the Lanham Act, but I do want to live in a world where the Lanham Act is actually about consumer protection. Um, and so uh, you you mentioned that uh, right, that you want to prevent coattailing, but the Lanham Act has never been about free riding. It's always only been about confusion. So if the if what this uh, right? If what this use is doing is interfering in some way, in a competitive way, with what the mark holder does, I think that's a really different question from whether it's just providing a sort of extra enlargement of the pie, right? A, a, a new revenue stream. Isn't that wonderful? Um, it, isn't it, isn't it great if people can uh, take advantage of markets made by? others as long as they're not interfering with those markets. Oh, I, we're running really short on time, and I just, we, <laughs> since we told you all that we were going to take questions, I wanted to at least have the opportunity to see if we have any questions. <laughs> if we don't, then we'll let them go on and keep fighting this one out. Um, but are there any, yeah, please stand up and let us know. Well, I it may be the case that in some of these cases, the, the courts do say, well, look, this is not going to have a negative impact on the brand. But I, I would actually go further and, said, e and say, even if there is a negative impact on the brand, that may be okay because it's protected, because there's, there's First Amendment values at stake. I mean, just to go back to my examples from things like the social network or the informant or uh, what was the other one I meant? The insider. Um, all of those movies probably did have some negative impact on 
uh, whether it was Facebook or Marshall Daniels Midland or Brown and Williamson Company, and that's okay. That's allowed. You're allowed to make negative references to trademarks. Um, one, if you're not confusing the public, um, and two, if there's if there are these important First Amendment uh, uh, interests at stake. Can I can I say I agree 100% with Ben on on that? And in <laughs> fact, I think that is the way the law should be. And in fact, it's the way the law is written. The the dilution statute, which is what deals expressly with tarnishment, because <laughs> remember, the pure 43A claim is merely about confusion. Um, the the tarnishment statute or the anti dilution statute expressly says it does not apply to non commercial speech and so um, the in in it there shouldn't you shouldn't even get past the pleading stage in saying that the depiction of say the Louis Vuitton luggage harms their brand um, all they can really be able to pursue at least on the federal level but most state statutes mimic the federal level, but all that they should be able to do is say look there's there's confusion and I think, depending on the jurisdiction I'm in, I should get b beyond the Rogers articulation of it in my jurisdiction. But the, um, the, the, uh, the, the harm to the trademark owner from the depictions is just not something that Congress said the trademark law should address. Yeah, I think let's do one more question, and I think then we're out of time. Well, you're, you're, you've highlighted something that's very important that's kind of a, something, a, a third participant in all of this, which is the insurance company that underwrites an errors and omissions policy for the studios for their content so that when they get sued, they can ha have some insurance to cover their defense costs. And in order to protect that coverage, most of those policies require them to adhere to prudent clearance procedures. And if they fail to do that, the coverage will usually be denied. So that may account for why in that instance, the filmmaker said, you know, let's try and clear this use. And then maybe they made a decision, well, it's, we're gonna do it anyway or we're not gonna do it anyway. But a lot of these um, initial f uh, contacts with trademark owners or others uh, are driven by their policy requirements. Yeah, and I'll just, just to add on that, and I actually used to do clearance in-house when I was at um, NBC. Um, gen very generally speaking, I mean, we were, these were, we all, we've been discussing cases where the, the product actually did end up in the movie. Um, by and large, uh, studios, production companies are fairly conservative in their clearance practices. Because let's say you have a situation and it's, it's kind of a close call. Um, and if you, uh, if you go ahead and use it, you might end up in a lawsuit, um, it's gonna spend you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars litigating it. You have the potential for even a, an injunction in joining you know, release of your TV show which is an, uh, or a movie, which is an utter disaster. That, that's on one hand, if you go ahead and do it. On the other hand, maybe you make a slight change. Maybe you put a generic label instead of a Coca-Cola label and go ahead and do it, and it's really not that big of a deal. You might get some griping from the, from the writers or, or producers. And in many, many, many cases, whether it's about trademarks or copyrights or other IP rights involved, it's just easier to make a little change, not use the actual thing, um, instead of risking the lawsuit. So by and large, clearance practices are uh, pretty conservative driven by litigation risk, by insurance company demands, etc.